My name is Labrini Thoma. I'm a journalist for around 32 years now. Um, I'm a lefty. <laughs> I started as a young anarchist when I was 14 years old after the Greek Yunda. Moved a little to the right since then, but still never left. This is my, my place. I'm a little bit more Marxist now. How old were you that. when the coup took place? I was three. You were three. I was okay, three so years old, and I was ten when they left, and was a very, um, very politicized era for for Greece at the time when they left. Uh, when we won, actually, it was the Polytechnic. Yes, well, it was supported uh, from the United States. We had the tragedy of Cyprus, of course, at the same time, which was supported by <laughs> the United States too, and from the English. Don't forget the good old <laughs> friends of the United States. And um, there was an uprising by the students in 1973, the Polytechnic uprising, and a tank brought down the door of the Polytechnic. They killed 21 students at the time. And it was a big um, uh, universal uproar against them. And after that, they had to change. We had a second Yunda for six months. And then they lost after the, the Cypriot uh, tragedy. Um, people were against them anymore. That's when you have people against you in and out of the country, you can't survive. So that's how it went. Anyway, I grew up in a country where politics are the main thing. We all talk about politics. That's how Greece is. And I started with this crisis. I started thinking what we could do for our people. We're lucky enough to have a way, work. We have work so we can live. But there's so many people, so many families who have nothing anymore, no jobs. Uh, try to survive in a very difficult condition. Uh, people are really in a very... Uh, sometimes people say, humanitarian crisis, how can you talk about the humanitarian crisis in a European country, you know? We have a humanitarian crisis. And how long has that been going on in Greece? For four or five years now. I, I'll, I'll tell you this, why you don't see it in the streets? Because we're a very... Uh, a, a people who has a very strong sense of... axioprepia. Uh, um, Pride. 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 We're, we're a pride, proud people. Uh, in this municipality, we're in a blue collar area called Peristeri. It's a working class area. There's like 80% of the people are working class. That means half the people are unemployed right now in this area. We so are 50% unemployed. Yeah, 50% in, this in this area only. So we have a lot of people who don't have to eat. But the mayor did this. He doesn't make soup kitchens. He has people who... Um, volunteers with uh, bikes who take the food to the houses of the people. So they don't have to get out and stand in the line, you know, to eat. So you don't see the soup kitchen anywhere, but it's here. We have to feed our people every day. They don't have to eat. So it's a humanitarian crisis, the European way or the Greek way, but there is, it is here. In schools, we have kids that are um, t uh, losing their you know, they're they're fainting, they're fainting, fainting, they're fainting, fainting because they're in, in their fainting yes in, in the schools, schools because they don't have to eat, and it's, they started a program two years ago uh, with uh, breakfast for kids at school because there were so many that couldn't afford it, couldn't afford to eat. Uh, there were kids who didn't have anything to eat for three days. And they were taken to the hospital after fainting out because they were in a bad, bad condition. And on that, we have the, the crisis in Syria and all those people and all those kids coming to Greece. It's such a shame that such a wonderful country, wonderful people, but is I now mean, destroyed. In the United now. States, they talk now about the refugee crisis, but they don't make a connection. It's because of the bombing. Yes. How can you talk about a refugee crisis and not Without. look at the reasons? That people are leaving their homes, they're forced home. out of their homes. And their families, it's not like people who are um, financial immigrants. They're not coming here <clears throat> to make money, you know, and sent back home like the immigrants we had before, <clears throat> where they cannot make money here because there are no jobs here. But anyway, they were coming, trying to go to Northern Europe maybe. So we're having families with kids, people who are well-educated coming here, and we have to support them too. 
If you see the stories that come here from the islands, like Lesbos or Kos, of the condition of the people there. Actually, uh, I was reading today a message. There's, a, there's an uh, NGO called Agalia in Lesbos, which means a hug. And they're supporting all those people. There are like two or 3,000 people every two days arriving on the island. And he was saying, please send us even 50 euro, because we know how to make them 100 meals. And we have to feed all those people. And he said something wonderful, too. This guy, Yorgos, who is one of the four members that created Agalia, that the tourists, you know, you go to the Greek islands for tourism. They're not just staying there at the beach. They're helping the immigrants. And this is something you don't see in the news. But they uh, went and uh, uh, joined the Greeks in supporting the people who arrived, the Syrian people who arrived there. Anyway, they're arriving in a very poor country, in a crisis, and we cannot really support them, give them jobs, because we don't have jobs for our people. You know, it's, we're in a very bad condition right now. And I mean, the bombing, uh, U.S. bombing of Syria, U.S. bombing of Libya, U.S. Yes, bombing maybe. of Iraq, U.S. bombing of Afghanistan, uh, uh, of, of Yemen now, where the United States is supporting the yes. bombing of the people of Lebanon. It seems like the United States is destroying the, the whole region with this mass militarization. And But it, in the United States, there's no organized mass opposition to bomb and war uh, against they can, the people. Uh, until now, they do whatever they want unpunished. The United States do whatever they want to do unpunished. And that's why now we're in a very dangerous situation because being unpunished and feeling that they can do whatever they want, they're doing things that we're all going to pay very dearly. That's at least what I believe. So we're not, and we have this. We believe that the people who kicked the tyrant since the ancient years is a hero. We have a very strange democ uh, sense of democracy here. So anyway, uh, Back in 2012, after taking to Sidagma Square and doing what we could for the other people, uh, I was having a show at the radio, and it was 4 to 5 o'clock in the evening, and just before my show, it was a news bulletin. And it was October 16th, October 17th, we were going to have a strike as a union of journalists because we're like everybody else. We're having cuts and, you know, our uh, labor rights were withdrawn as they say, for a while, you know, so and stuff like that. So uh, the news bulletin started with the phrase, uh, the union of journalists is struggling the municipal radio of Athens, where I was working, and um, they're not allowing us to produce a program on poverty tomorrow because they're having a strike. When the news bulletin finished and I started my show, I said that the union of journalists is not struggling anyone, that we are... Uh, members of a union and we have to strike when the union says we have to strike and even for more than one day because the, it was a one day strike you know it was like nothing actually and that nobody uh, that th that was not the news that was the opinion of the director of the station so when the show finished they called me upstairs to the office of the director to tell me that the show is off I'm not gonna do another show again and not only that, but they would move me to um, work in the portal, a news portal, from 6 in the evening to 12 o'clock in the night. Now I I'm a single parent, and I was then uh, seeing my son after 6 o'clock in the evening, and he knew it, the director knew that. So he did it to punish me, so that I couldn't see my, my, my son, who was in his two last years for the university. To, to give his exams to go to the university at the time. Now, to be honest, if he didn't do that with my kid, maybe I wouldn't take it to the edge. But trying to punish me in my house, you know, not only at the job, but in my house, trying to destroy my life, trying to destroy my kid, I'm not going to allow that as much as I can. And I was lucky enough to have very good colleagues at, at work. So I went to the union, did... Um, uh, said what happened and asked the union to help. The union tried to see him, he refused. And when the union decided to do a, a three-day strike, he fired me. Then the, the strike became an eight-day strike. And 
it was near to closing. The station was near to closing when he, he moved back and he said that he will accept me back to work, but without a show. And he will give me a good... Um, I will be in the morning, you know, so I could see my kid in the evening. And it took us eight days of strike to, to win that, but we won. We won. I went back. You know, sometimes you say I won, but thing is, when you are back and the union doesn't have the power to protect you anymore, they make your life a living hell. So that's how it was two years after that. He could do anything to destroy my day. He will try. I was his personal goal, my boss, and I'm very proud of it, had the personal goal of destroying my day every day. You know, he was micromanaging everything I was doing. So it was, it was a great experience. I don't want to have it again, but, you know, but, but, but it showed the power of the union. It showed what, when the workers were a hundred workers there working at the station, when they're one next to the other, what we can do. And for me, it showed that for all those years that I was next to the others, I took it back a hundred times. When I was in need, all those people that I was next to, when they were fighting, were there for me. And they brought their friends. And nobody dared to say, where were you before? When I needed someone, you know? Because I was there. That was the good thing of being a left since a young age. So they were like, you cannot do that to Labrini. She was next to us all those years, you know? We cannot allow it to happen to her. And I, I was very lucky. I was very lucky with this. And I'm optimistic because of that. I know we can win. I know we can win against monsters. After that happened, I decided to take their, um, you know, Greece came down about 46 positions in the uh, Freedom of the Press uh, index. From 23, we're now in 99 this year down to 99. So that year I decided that the right thing to do was take my days off and go to the United States and try to talk about the condition of the press in Greece. Try to find universities who would accept me and go to speak to the students and the teachers and the people there. And we did that, but we didn't have a lot of power, so we did do two or three universities that we could. And we made an article with Nick, my boyfriend, and we tried to, you know, say that to the people. And it was a very good experience. It was very good because the American people are good people. When they hear your story and when they see the facts, they can understand very well what's happening. And sometimes I was feeling that when they were hugging me after the, the, sh the, the, the showing and the talk, it was like hugging all the Greek people, you know? It was like standing there, you know? We're here with you, which was very moving and very beautiful. And that's why I'm still optimistic. I will always be optimistic because I know how the people are. No, that's the important thing. And the political developments in Turkey now, um, this Syriza was a... In Greece. In Greece, rather. Was a, was a development uh, of opposition to the policy of the government and the government's uh, economic policy of austerity. And uh, Syriza, uh, what did you think of, of the formation of it and where is Greece now politically? Well, there's two things. One is the power and how you can see uh, parties forming and parties, dissol parties dissolving and that, and there's the people. And I do care about the people. Syriza was, uh, came to power because of the people. It was a 4% party five years ago. If five years ago you'll say to their own people, to Syriza people, to Tsipras, you're going to be prime minister in five years, you will say, come on, you know? This cannot happen now. We're a four percent fridge party. Sometimes they weren't able not uh, to get in the parliament. So this four percent became a thirty-six percent because they were anti-memorandum. And, and what the, is the memorandum? The memorandums are three now. <laughs> the third one is the left one. <sighs> They're destroying the history of these people. The the the, the word left was a go good word in this land until now. And uh, what was the, the memorandum what was the memorandum mean? Memorandums are kind of laws and it's no it's a new way of uh, um, colonialism. What happened is the poor countries of Europe, Greece being the poorest of them, were taken into euro, the monetary union, which was to strengthen up the already strong. 
And when they became very indebted, they were said that you have to become poorer, your workers have to have no rights, and we have to take from you all the money we can get, and only the banks can survive. And that's a memorandum. We started the European Union. It started with this beautiful story about the people of Europe being united, about living all together, about loving each other. It was a hippie dream, the European Union. And then, of course, it was a monetary union. What happened? <laughs> monetary unions are not the kind of unions that people want, you know? It's the kind of world that capitalists wants. So what happened is the European Union, along with the IMF, of course, they finished the jobs in Latin America and Africa, and now they can take over Europe. And the European Central Bank, who has the money right now, we don't have a central Greek money. We don't have a central bank in Greece. We don't have our own money. We have the euro, which belongs to someone else, and he can do whatever he wants with it. So we're, we're not only indebted, we're not free. So we're a country, that's why I'm, it's neo-colonialism. We're a country that they use, uh, uh, they take in everything away from. Like, you know what happened with, uh, it's a good story, what happened with the airports? The small airports in Greece, like in Corfu, in Rhodes, they have a lot of work because we have tourism. We have 14 such airports that were sold to a German company because the memorandum says so, privatizations and stuff. The German company is, belongs to the German state. It's a state-owned company who bought our privatized airports and the money they paid was the money that the Corfu airport alone makes in a year. So we're slaves, that's what we are. We shouldn't pretend that we're a free nation anymore. Syriza sold to the people the dream of freedom. What Tsipras was saying is, we're gonna be free again. We're gonna stop this. And he became a government because of that. He, became, he took 36% because of that. Not only Tsipras, before that. The first who accepted the first memorandum was the Social Democrats. Kind of the Democrats of the United States, I think. And then, the, the right at the time said that this is not good, that we should go to, um, we should have our sovereignty, we should not accept this, and people vote for the right. When the right government was elected, they brought the second memorandum. <laughs> so, yes, of course, it's nice to be free and everything, but you can't say no to Angela Merkel, right? So, so the second memorandum came with them, but the people who voted for them were anti-memorandum. That's why I say we mustn't, you know, think that the government and the people are doing the same things. No, it's different. The people voted for an anti-memorandum government. The anti-memorandum government became memorandum when it became a government and brought the second memorandum. So the people of the right moved to the left. It was a great radicalization. And the party of 4% became to 36% because all those people, right, centrists, left, decided that they wanted their freedom again. That's what's happening. So they vote for Syriza because Syriza is the anti-memorandum party and Syriza becomes a government and the third memorandum is coming. So we're three times betrayed. And then Syriza decides to do the referendum. And why did they want to have a referendum? According to people like Yanis Varoufakis, who was the minister of finance at the time, they wanted to have the referendum because they believed that the Greek people will vote yes and not no. And if the people vote yes, they can go and say, we cannot go against the will of the people. You know? Because they wanted to say yes, they couldn't find any more. But the people said no, 63% no. This is a proud people. And this 63% no, in one hour, when he went to the European Union to Brussels, became a yes. And he said yes to everything, Tsipras was the biggest betrayal of all, not only for the people, but for the left too. But all the left didn't support him. No, no, but now we're again in a situation where the people are anti-memorandum and there are no powers to express that. But the KKD Elected, or, the or, communist or, or party, this new party that's for me. The yeah, communist right. party did the mistake of not wanting to collaborate with others or 
okay, they're they're into purity, you know. So people so will not the, so go what was there. Their position on the on the referendum. They said don't vote at all. So they abstained. They abstained, yeah. Most of their people don't be so. They don't follow that, you know. They have about three or four uh, percent of their uh, previous voters that voted for Syriza, who want the the people to. But those will go back to the Communist Party now, obviously. Thing is, our people, 63% of our people, is radicalized. I won't say left or right or anything, but radicalized, really. It's on our hand to do something with it um, because of the memorandums and because of the situation right now. And this 62% of the people has no electoral uh, expression. They thought Syriza was that, but it's not. So what we have now is Syriza is broken into two or three parts. Uh, their ANEL, which was their uh, governmental ally, will not get into the parliament because they're anti-memorandum right. And now they're memorandum right. So you have a big memorandum right party. Why go vote for the small one, you know? And there's a part of Syriza who will get about what they say 7 to 11% in the elections, who is the anti-memorandum part and has the strongest names of Syriza in it. And then there's Golden Dawn. And who is Golden Dawn? Golden Dawn is the fascist, the neo-Nazis. And the problem, and the racists, and everything that you, well, not as hard as in other countries, because we have a strong democratic uh, uh, tradition. tradition in Greece, but they're strong now. They used to be in 0.4 percent before the before the crisis. crisis. Now they're around seven percent, and they say they will get more than 12 percent in the next election. Now there's a growth of the right wing in Europe. Yes, uh, because there is the left. Uh, people don't see a solution from the left, and the right wing is growing, and that's and happening globally. I mean, see in in that. You should doubt that in Greece, the left betrayed the people right now. They're living that betrayal. They believed in it. They brought it from 4% to 36%. We, uh, Tariq Ali was opening champagnes on TV on the first left government in Europe. The people in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, in all the countries that are suffering because of, of the memorandums, they were like, in Ireland, we have a left, something's changing. And then Tsipras, Tsipras was the new hope of the left in the world. He went and betrayed them, but all the, of them. The idea that you're going to change a system by an election, or the idea that, uh, that capitalism, which is what we have globally, uh, you can reform it. I mean, you can make the banks better, or you can make the capitalist governments do, do behave themselves and not do what they're doing. Isn't this illusionary, the, the fact that uh, you would have an, a, uh, an idea that, the, uh, that this capitalist crisis uh, can solve itself without the working class taking action. Yes, it is. But the thing is, most of the people are not ready for revolution. I don't know now. I don't know what will go happen to Greece in the next few years. Because we're the same proud people and we have no parliamentary expression in a way. You know, I believe that maybe we'll see it's a different fight now. It's not the old good capitalism. It's another kind of capitalism. Stronger, uh, more brutal, even more brutal. They may not kill us in hundreds in, in the mines, but they know how to do it for countries, for whole countries. That's what's happening now. There's the enslavement of whole countries. So, and where they try to see if they can do it in Europe. And they can do it with like white folk, you know? We also decided, as a, I'm talking as a people, after the first one here in Sidagma Square, we were there on the streets every day, and seeing that the government was ready to kill us, see that they were... We have some heroes of the Second World War still, still alive. One of them, Manolis Glezos, was a MP for Syriza and then an MEP for Syriza. He was the man who brought down the German Nazi flag in '42. Uh, he went up to the Acropolis, there was a flag there, at night with one of his friends, Santos, and brought it down. 
So he's kind of living history for us. He's the pride of the nation. And he's a teenager in his heart. He's a teenager of the left. So Manolis Glezos uh, was uh, on Sindagma Square with us. And they throw in on his face uh, tear gas, on his face of a 90-year-old hero. When you see that, the, what they say to you is, if we can do that to him, we can kill you. And nobody will care. So that's what happened with the people. The people couldn't take the streets anymore because they had this strong machine, this brutal machine against them who was ready to kill them. The message was, you know, very well uh, ar arrived to the people easily because when you do that to him, you're going to kill us. After that, people went back home and chose the electoral way because you don't want to die. You want to live and fight another day, hopefully. But, you know, it was a very brutal time. Every day we were on the streets, every day there was tear gas and the police was hitting on us and there were people, uh, there were people who were committing suicides in plain view to, to uh, like Christoulas, an old man, a pharmacist, a chemist. He killed himself on Sidagma Square and left a message saying that he's doing this against the memorandums and he wants the people to fight. So we, had, uh, we have around 10,000 um, suicides in Greece because of financial reasons in the last two years. That's a genocide. Okay, so it's a financial genocide. They have new ways of killing us now, but that's a genocide. And because those were things were suppressed in the press. They, as you know, they, they closed the national television and they were... Um, they were having under control all the private ones because there's a big triangle of power between the TV, the public sector, and the government. They're all together now and ever. <laughs> and, and so what happened was the information was mouth to mouth. We're giving it to each other. And it was kind of a new kind of yunda. It wasn't freedom. And the, the government we had then was not a, it was a coalition government. They were not having, it was actually a minority government as a coalition government. They didn't have 50% of the vote altogether. So there was a problem there too. There was no democracy. And the people were, there were a lot of measures against the people in all parts of their lives. Although this was happening, we voted 62% to 63% in the referendum. I'm going to say it again. You have a people that has all of them against them and still has the pride say, fuck you. That's what 63% is, fuck you. We want to be poor and proud if we can, you know? Now, if they try to, in, the implement, words, if they try to implement this memorandum, um, you, we don't know what's going to happen with the government, this new government uh, that is formed. Uh, do you think people will oppose the policies of the referendum? For example, selling off, privatizing, islands, private, uh, cutting the pensions. I mean, it sounds like you have a horrendous situation already for, yes. for the working class, the public workers, others. To, to implement this will mean even further uh, tax on the conditions of the working class, the poor of, of Greece. We're going to have people dying in the streets in a while. That's where we are now, right now. And I say again, we're the lucky ones. We have jobs, me and Nick, and we can survive. And there's some people, too, that can survive and can help. But the main part of the working class in Greece, they will have huge problems. We have 2 million people unemployed right now. I don't, uh, what's the population of Greece? 10 million. And 2 million people are unemployed. Okay, so if you take the students there, you come the students and the people who are in pension, you see it's, it's a, I think it's, a, they call it less than 30, 30 something percent, but that's the official number. They don't count the people who work for even one hour every month. If you're working like uh, four hours a week, you're not counted unemployed in Greece. So those are not the real numbers, you know. The real numbers are different. And now the main, the, the, um, the basic uh, wage is 400 euro per month, while the rent for a small house, like uh, 300 feet, is 200 euro. How can you survive? 
See? How will you pay for everything to support yourself? How will you make a family? You know how many young people don't get married anymore? There are no kids born in this country anymore because they cannot afford it. They would love to, but, you know. So, and we're losing, the brain drain is huge. The brain drain is like, only in Germany the last few years, there were 3,000 doctors that left Greece for Germany. Doctors. You say he's a doctor, he's going to survive, you know? Medicine doctors. No. I even met some Greek medicine doctors that went there for, to survive in New York. You have a community there right now. Creating. Uh, so this created. is this is happening in Puerto Rico too. People are being forced out; they can't survive. Yes, it's like that. So this is the recolonization of of Greece and yes. the destruction of the Greek as uh, the Greek people and the conditions of Greek. What action should the Greek people take to defend themselves? In your view, I trust my people. I wasn't so sure about them until five years ago. The crisis makes me trust them. If they manage to not fall in, in the hands of Golden Dawn. What did the 62% of the people want? I mean, basically, they didn't want this austerity. They didn't want the economic policies that the Merkel and the banks want to impose in, in Greece. Yeah. So how, how is Greece, I mean, is, Greece is not alone. Other countries face the same thing. How are the people in Greece going to be able to fight back against the whole power, economic power of capitalism, of the banks worldwide? One basic thing is they don't fall in the hands of Golden Dawn. We, we must take care that our people are not falling for the fascists. Because if they decide that the electoral way doesn't work, and it shows like that, Maybe some of them, especially those that moved to, that were radicalized, but they're coming from the right, will go back to them. Don't forget that Nazism has some socialist um, sperm of ideology in it, and maybe they would try to see the, the nice part of it. Sorry to say those words, but you know, for the, the right wing people, it's like that. They can move there. That's the biggest danger right now. After the colonial powers against us, <laughs> okay, because the main thing is this, and that's what people are trying to do. And if they vote for the Nazis, not because they became Nazis, it's because they see no other electoral way to get out of their problem, and they're not ready to take, to be killed, because revolution is deciding that you can die for what you believe, you know. But I believe that because we're a proud nation, we will not do that. We will not fall in the hands of the gold, of Golden Dawn. And we will find a, a way out. This must be a new way out. The main problem is to see if we have some new weapons as a working class. All our old weapons, but the, um, the uh, strike that will never stops, the, the, the how do we call that Occupation kind of? Occupation or... No, or a indefinite, strike, a, indefinite, indefinite strike. strike. If we don't go on a general indefinite strike, that's the only real weapon we have from the old ones. There's no other one working. So an indefinite general strike with occupations, mm -hmm. workers running mm -hmm. and taking mm -hmm. over Greece. Yeah. Are people ready for that? In some occasions, yes, they are. They did that. They did it that in the national radio, uh, national radio and television in Thessaloniki. They did it that in uh, a few um, industrial compounds. They took over them and they're working on them. They did that in restaurants. We were closing and the workers took the restaurant over and they're going doing very well. Actually, if you want, we can go and eat there <laughs> uh, in Athens. And there were unemployed people who joined them. And they're now they're working fine, you know, with tourists and everything because they're doing good food. And so there was certain aspects of it and they were successful. So the, the society understands that this is a way there. But... The main thing is, what else do we have in our hands? We don't know. The main problem is that capitalism knows most of our weapons and they can take them off, take them from us, but general, indefinite strike. And we have to decide if we have any new weapons and or create our new weapons. We're the clever ones. We are the ones that built the world, right? So <laughs> we will find our way, but it's the moment in history where you have to find those and it's like birth 
It's the most painful moment. So is where exactly we are now in Greece.